Hello, and welcome to this free Lunch and Learn webinar by Accelerate Computer Training, Excel 2019 Pivot Tables and VLOOKUPS. I'm Tim Jones, owner of Accelerate Computer Training, and I'm so glad you're here. In my 30 plus years of teaching computer software training classes, the most frequent remark I hear from students who have been out interviewing for jobs is, they asked if I knew Excel, and I said yes. Then they asked if I knew Pivot Tables and VLOOKUPS. Ugh. It's as though pivot tables and VLOOKUPS are the only features in Excel worth knowing. Now, we know that's not true, but they certainly seem to be used as the measure of how well someone knows Excel. In the next 60 minutes, I'm going to teach you how to use pivot tables and VLOOKUPS so that next time you can say with confidence, after some practice of your own, of course, yes, I know pivot tables and VLOOKUPS. Now, your microphones are off during this webinar to keep the audio channel clear. We are recording this session and we'll send you the link as soon as it's posted on our YouTube channel. If you have a question during the session, please type it into the chat window. I'll try to reserve the last few minutes of the session for answering questions. And now, let's get started. First up, pivot tables. I'll take just a few moments to show you what pivot tables can do, then dive right into the how-to. A pivot table is a data summarization tool capable of consolidating large amounts of source data into concise, interactive summaries. Let's say you manufacture clothing, pants, shirts, sweaters, and you keep your production data in an Excel sheet. If this is your source data, you could, with just a few clicks, create a pivot table that sums up the quantities produced of each item. As you can see here, a pivot table summarizes the rows of source data that have identical values in a specified column. For example, rolling up these three pant quantities into one sum. The two shirt quantities into one sum. And the three sweater quantities into one sum. It can also provide a grand total. A pivot table gets its name from the fact that you can rotate or pivot the report anytime you like. For example, you might move the row labels, pants, shirt, and sweater, to column labels. You might then choose to add more detail to the report by introducing additional fields, like size, which in turn rolls up quantities by summing rows of the same item and size like these two rows of large pants. Now, let's see how to work with pivot tables. Pivot tables are based on data. So let's talk a little about your source data first. Your source data needs three things to work well for a pivot table. First, in your source data list, you need column labels at the top. This is called your header row or the header row of the list and it provides your field names. Next, your source data needs one or more columns that contain repeated values. I call these attribute columns because they describe the entity stored in your list. For example, each row in this production data list, which is a thousand rows long by the way, represents a batch of garments produced, a production run. So columns like item and size and color contain values that describe each batch. And there are only a handful of distinct entries in these attribute columns. For example, shirt, 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 pant, sweater, lots of repeated values. That's the kind of stuff a pivot table can summarize well on. Now, lastly, your source data needs one or more columns of numbers to crunch. So we've got quantities produced, we've got profits anticipated. So that's what your source data needs. What your source data does not need are subtotals. If you've introduced subtotals into your source list, you have to get rid of them. Your source data must just be pure data raw data. Now you can base a pivot table on a normal data range or on a table. 
And you start just by selecting any one cell in the list or in the table. Then you go to the insert tab on the ribbon and click the pivot table button. You'll confirm the source data that you want to use to drive this pivot table. And again, it can be either a table or a range of cells. This is just a normal range of cells. And so it guessed exactly correctly the range of my list, A4 through L1004. Secondly, we'll choose to put this pivot table on its own separate worksheet with the new worksheet chosen. And click OK. The new empty pivot table appears on its own sheet. Excel displays some additional tabs on the ribbon, like this Pivot Table Analyze tab and the Design tab, as well as this Pivot Table Fields pane on the right, which includes a checkbox for each column of data in our source list and the Pivot Table Fields area down below, filters, columns, rows, and values that we will fill with fields from the list above as we start to build up our Pivot Table. Now, this is important. If you select a cell outside the pivot table, even outside this little uh, illustrative graphic, then all of those interface elements that I just introduced disappear. The contextual tabs are no longer on the ribbon. The pivot table fields pane goes away. To bring them back, just click back inside the pivot table. In other words, you've got to be in the kitchen to do any cooking. If you step out of the kitchen, they take away your tools. So don't panic, just click back into the pivot table somewhere and all the pivot table interface elements will reappear. Uh, before we start building up this pivot table, let's give this sheet a better name. I'll call it prod pivot, as in production pivot. And now to populate the pivot table, we drag fields from the list here in the pivot table fields pane down into the areas below. I'll drag item into rows and quantity into values. And you can see the pivot table has now sprung to life and is showing us the summarization of all the quantities produced of pant, shirt, and sweater. Now, regard, uh, as an alternative to dragging fields down into the areas, you could just check their boxes, but at that point, it's anybody's guess into which of the four areas that field will land. So I prefer dragging. It's also worth noting that this summarization is for a thousand rows or is of a thousand rows of data. And it happens really quickly. Now, pivot tables are interactive. We can summarize the data differently simply by dragging fields into different areas at the bottom of the pivot table fields pane. A couple of notes on that. You do not have to fill all four of these areas to generate a pivot table, as you can see, but you must fill the values area. And you can put more than one field in the same area, but you can't use the same field more than once except in the values area. Now I'll drag size down into the rows area to show you what it looks like when you use more than one field in the same area. Notice this nice outline effect that we get in the pivot table when we include multiple fields in the same area. Alternatively, let's drag size over into columns and the sizes now will appear as column labels. Uh, by default, they appear in alphabetical order, but we can rearrange them to suit our needs just by dragging the column labels. I'll click on small point to the edge of the column label cell, anywhere where you get that drag and drop shaped pointer, uh, which looks like a hand, by the way, on the Mac, not like the four headed arrow that we have here on the PC. And you'll press and hold and drag. Now, outside of a pivot table, this would normally just move that one cell, but in a pivot table, it knows that you intend to move the entire column. So there it goes. And likewise, I'll take medium and drag it into position so that our sizes are arranged the way we would like, small, medium, large, extra large. Regarding the numbers in the pivot table, by default, Excel sums our values, but we can choose other functions instead. For example, let's ask for the average quantity produced in each production run. 
One way to do that is to come down here into the values area, click on the field you're trying to work with, and choose value field settings. In the value field settings dialog box, in the summarize values by tab of it, we see all of the functions that pivot tables can perform. Sum, count, average, and so forth. Now, having chosen average, I know that averages aren't always nice, pretty, round numbers, so I'll take the opportunity to jump into the number formatting command while we're here. They make it easy to get to. Number format. And since these are uh, quantities produced, we'll go with number formatting of maybe one decimal place. And we won't need thousand separators. And there we go. Now the pivot table is returning the average quantity of garments produced in each of those 1,000 production runs over there in, the, in our source data. We can use the same pivot table to summarize on different fields as well, to tell a different story. And to remove a field from use in the pivot table, you can either just uncheck its box or you can drag it out of its respective area. Uh, I'll remove size by unchecking its box and I'll remove quantity by dragging it out just so you can see those two techniques and just drop, dropping it out here into the worksheet area where the X appears on your mouse pointer. Any place where that X appears is fair game to remove a field from use in the pivot table. Next, I'll put item over here in columns. And we'll put profit into the values area. So now we have items across the top, pants, shirt, sweater, and um, profit in the values area. And now we can also include date fields in our summaries. Uh, they provide flexible ways to summarize our data chronologically. So let's see what happens when we bring this finish date field, that was the date that each production batch was completed, down into the rows area. And we can see we get these nice summarizations of the dates in which each production run was completed. Since Excel version 2016, Pivot Table does this automatic grouping for you. In versions prior to that, it does not, but you can group them using this wonderful group field command here manually. <clears throat> By default, like I said, Excel 2016 and later will group your dated rows into years and quarters and months. And you can expand them as you see me doing here simply by clicking their collapse expand buttons. You can also apply filtering criteria to the pivot table fields to cause the summaries to be based on only rows of source data that satisfy that criteria. One way to filter is using these simple column label and row label filter menus that are right there on the pivot table. Let's say that for whatever reason we didn't want to see shirts in the pivot table for a moment. Clicking the column labels menu and we can simply uncheck the shirt checkbox and click OK and shirts disappear. The grand totals, of course, update to reflect the missing data or to only sum up the pants and sweaters. To bring shirts back, we'll click back on the column labels menu and choose clear filter from item. And the shirts are back. You can also filter by placing fields in this filters area of the pivot table fields pane. For example, Perhaps we want to filter by size. I'll drag the size field down here into the filters area. It adds a size filter menu up here in the top row of the worksheet. And as we click that filter menu, this creates what I think of as a paging mechanism, as in show me the medium page of the report. And as I choose the medium size and hit OK, the numbers all change as it's filtering at the source le level to only include medium sized garments produced. Or go back to the filter menu or show me the, just the large page of the report or go back to showing me the whole thing again and click OK when you're done. 
Lastly, you can also use slicers to filter. Uh, slicers provide a quick, dynamic way to filter pivot table reports. They're great to use when you're asked to quickly apply multiple filters to a pivot table, perhaps in a meeting or a presentation when you're on the spot, because you can quickly respond to requests like, show us total profits for only small purple pants. Now to add your slicers, you click the insert slicer button that's found on the analyze tab of the ribbon. And from the list of fields that appear, you check off each of the fields by which you'd like to apply filters with slicing. Also, I'll choose item and size and color. And as I click OK, the slicer panes appear for each field I selected. And we can move and resize these panes if we want to. They appear as floating graphic objects on the worksheet. You can resize them using the sizing handles, as you see me doing now. And you can move them by simply pointing into their title bar and dragging them around like you would any other window. Then you filter by simply selecting or deselecting buttons on the various slicer panes. Uh, I talked about small purple pants. Well, if I click the small button, the pivot table shows us only small sized garments. Click pants, only small pants. Click purple, only small purple pants. Quick and easy, interactive, and you can use your, uh, your common selection techniques, your list selection techniques of click and shift click to select multiple buttons. For example, if I click once on black and shift click on purple, it selects the whole range of buttons in between. Uh, if I wanted to use both pants and sweaters but not shirts in between, holding down the control key, this would be the command key on the Mac, clicking sweater, We'll add that to the selection as well. And so now we're seeing pants and sweaters, but not shirts. So shift clicking to select ranges and control clicking to select non-adjacent ranges. When you're done using your slicers, you probably want to clear away all the filters. And to do so, there's a convenient button in the top right corner of each slicer pane. The clear filter button on each of those will get us back to where we're seeing summarizations of all the data in the source list. To dismiss the slicer panes, we simply delete them as you would a, a drawn ob object or a graphic object. You select the slicer by clicking its title bar and press the delete key on your keyboard. Click and the delete key on the keyboard. Now, by nature, a pivot table performs myriad calculations as it summarizes the rows of source data that share those common values. But you can go beyond those summarization calculations and perform calcs within the pivot table itself. Uh, to get ready for this, I'm going to simplify the pivot table a bit. I'll remove these date fields from the rows area. And I'll put item in rows instead. And I'll move size from filters over into columns. Next, we're going to go back to that value field settings command. The value field settings command has another tab in it. As we look at this dialog box for the second time, we see the tab show values as, which lets us ask the pivot table to show each summary result as it relates to some other value, like percent of grand total, percent of column total, percent of row total, and a number of others. I'll choose percent of grand total this first time and click OK. And now we see each sum of profit number appearing as its percentage contributing toward this grand total. To return to showing the actual sum values, we'll just repeat those steps, clicking the field in the values area, choosing the value field settings command, going to the show values as tab, clicking the menu, but just choosing no calculation once again. Now there is a shortcut. If you right click on one of the number cells in the pivot table, the shortcut menu that appears lets you show values as and you get the same choices we saw in the value field settings dialog box.
for example, I'll choose percent of row total. And now we see each number presented as its percentage contributing to the total for that whole row. So we see that 26% of our profits from pants came from small pants, 22.8 from medium and so on. But what if we wanna see values and percents? Easy, just add the same field into the values area again. I told you that you couldn't use the same field twice except for the values area. That exception, as I drag profit back down here into the values area, allows us to do exactly what we're wanting to do. Notice that we now get the same numbers that we had been seeing before in one set of columns and the percentages in another. We can change these labels to make them more descriptive. Let's say um, percent uh, by item. And instead of sum of profit two, we'll just say sum of profit. And we probably want to make these sum of profit numbers look like currency. Earlier I showed you that you could do that using the value field settings dialog box. Now let me show you the shortcut. Simply right click on any one of those numbers whose number formatting you'd like to change and choose the number format command. Number format. This time since we're talking about profit I'll choose currency and we'll round to zero decimal places. There we go. So actual values and their percentages, in this case by row total, sitting side by side. As you know, the pivot table is based on the, based on the data in the source list or table. However, it does not update automatically if that source data changes. The huge number of calculations involved in creating a pivot table might slow you down if it had to update after every cell edit. Therefore, you must refresh manually to update a pivot table to reflect changes made to its source data. Uh, first, I'll make some minor changes to the pivot table. Let's say we want to sum quantity again instead of profit. So I'll drag profits out and we'll put item as our column headings. And we'll get rid of size. And we'll put quantity in values and color into rows. So our pivot table has responded accordingly now, where we're looking at items as the column labels and colors of items as the row labels. Now let's say that um, management has decided to combine beige garments into brown, that they don't want to distinguish anymore between the beige and brown color. We're going to roll them all into just brown. So going back to the source data, we see we've got some beige colored garments and we'll just do a quick find and replace. And we'll replace every occurrence of the word beige with the word brown. Replace all and it makes 151 replacements. So now the source data no longer has any uh, garments that are colored beige, they're all brown. But as we go back to the pivot table, yikes, there's still a beige row. Well, I'll tell you again, the pivot table does not update automatically if the source data changes. You have to refresh the pivot table. To do so, just be in the pivot table somewhere so that you get these additional tabs. Go to the pivot table analyze tab on the ribbon, click the refresh button, and watch this beige row disappear and the brown numbers here should change as I hit refresh and they sure did. It's not hard to do, you just have to remember that pivot tables don't refresh automatically, do it yourself. Once you've created a pivot table, a pivot chart comes almost for free. Pivot charts combine the interactive capabilities of pivot tables with the best features of charting to create beautiful visualizations of pivot table data. To create a pivot chart, just go to the pivot table analyze tab on the ribbon and click pivot chart. Just like when you make a, a normal chart, it asks you what kind of chart you'd like to use. And I'll go with this 3D stacked column chart here and click okay. 
the chart appears. And the pivot table fields pane has been recharacterized as the pivot chart field pane, <clears throat> along with different labels now in the four special areas, legend, axis. And we can rearrange fields there and bring in new fields as we've been doing in the context of the pivot table all along, but know that both the pivot chart and the pivot table will change together in response. They are inextricably connected to each other. For example, I'll reverse the roles of these two. Right now we have items as the legend and color in the X axis or category axis. I'll bring item down to axis and color over to legend and you can see the pivot table and the pivot chart have both essentially pivoted to now put the opposite item in each place. Item in the X axis and color now in the legend. While this is a pivot chart, it's still a chart, which means we can uh, use all of Excel's powerful formatting capabilities on it as well. The design tab on the ribbon is the chart design tab, and we can apply a different chart style so easily. All right, now, so far we've created a pivot table report where all the source data live nicely in a single list. However, when you get data from an external source, say an enterprise level database like SQL Server, you often find that the data you need is scattered across multiple related tables. For example, in this database model, we have three tables, travel bookings, travel agents, and travel destinations. Each row of data is assigned an ID number, an identifier, usually one and two and then three, et cetera. Those identifiers are used as points of relationship between the tables of data. Here, for example, we see trip number two was booked by agent number three, Carol Cox, to destination number one, Marrakesh. Now, that's exactly how databases ought to be built, but if we put agent and destination ID numbers on our pivot table report instead of agent and city names, no one will be able to make any sense of them. The good news is that since Excel 2016, sadly not in the Mac versions, Excel has a data model, a hidden component of every Excel workbook with the ability to create relationships between tables of data. And when you bring in external data, you're given the opportunity to add those tables to the data model. Then, if you define relationships between those tables, you can use fields from all the related tables in your pivot table reports. Let me show you how. Here I've got a workbook with three worksheets on it. Bookings, agents, and destinations just like in the example I just showed. Looking at the bookings table, we see it contains the ID number of the agent who made that travel booking and the destination number of the city where those travelers are headed. But we wanna use agent names and destination cities or countries or regions in our pivot table, not these ID numbers that are meaningless to humans. We'll need to create relationships between the three tables based on those ID numbers then we can create the pivot table and pull in fields from all three tables. To do that, we go to the data tab on the ribbon and use this relationships button here. I'll click relationships, click the new button to start a new relationship, and then we're given a table menu with our three tables, agents, bookings, destinations. Now, I wanna mention here that I created these three tables locally. I did not import them from some external data source, so they're not yet in the data model. That's why they're called worksheet table bookings, worksheet table agents, as opposed to data model table bookings or agents. Fortunately, however, as soon as you involve a local table in a relationship, Excel copies that table into the data model automatically. So I'll choose bookings in the first table menu, and then from the related table menu, let's say we'll build the relationship between bookings and agents first. So I'll choose agents. And here's a hint. 
In the one-to-many relationship that exists between related tables, always choose the many table here on this first row and the one table on that second row. Now we have to specify the details about how this relationship should be based or what should be based upon. As I click the column or foreign key field here, it presents the fields that live in the bookings table. And we know that in each booking, the agent number field holds the ID number of the agent who took that booking. And likewise, we know that in the agents table, there's an agent number field that identifies each agent uniquely. Now, while these two fields names are identical, they won't always be. It's the content of the field that makes for a healthy relationship. Let me demonstrate a little bit more. The relationship that I'm in the process of building back there in Excel says that a record or row of data in the bookings table is related to a record in the agents table if their agent numbers match, three in this case. This allows a booking record to find its related agent record and use its field values as though they were its own. Now, admittedly, I'm omitting a chunk of knowledge from this webinar about database designs, joins, or relationships between tables, primary and foreign key fields, all of which would help you understand what I just showed you how to do in Excel. But if you have that background knowledge, you can now use it to your advantage in Excel. And if you need that knowledge and would like me to put together a webinar or a video about it, just send me an email or write a comment. All right, we'll get back to it. I'll click OK here to confirm that first relationship. And then I'll make the other relationship between bookings and destinations. Clicking the New button, choosing Bookings, which is on the Many side of that relationship, and Destinations, which is on the One side. Using Destination Number as the foreign key field and as the primary key field in that relationship. Click OK and we'll click Close. Now we'll build the pivot table using fields from all three of those related tables. I'm going to select a cell not even in one of the lists, not even in one of the tables. And then go to Insert, just like we did before, and click Pivot Table just like we did before. The reason it doesn't matter which cell is selected this time is because we're not gonna base the pivot table on any data in a worksheet. We're gonna base it on this workbook's data model. So choose the data we wanna analyze, use this workbook's data model. And let's say we want the pivot table like before to land on its own new separate worksheet. I'll click OK. And the worksheet and pivot table appear. In the pivot table fields pane, we see all three tables. They can, we can expand them, agents, and we see its fields. Bookings, we see its fields. Destinations, likewise. Let's drag city down here into rows. And the cities now all appear as row labels in the pivot table. Next, let's put agent name as column headings. and the, the travel agents appear as column headings across the top. And finally, for numbers to crunch, let's say we want to know the number of days stayed in each city by each travel agent's booking. So we'll drag the length of stay field down here into values. The pivot table finally springs to life now showing the total travel days by city and agent. So that's how to use fields from multiple related tables in a pivot table report. I'll go ahead and close and save that file. All right, there's pivot tables. What a powerful summarization tool. Now let's turn our attention to the VLOOKUP function. The VLOOKUP function can be used in formulas to look down the first column of a list for a specific value or its closest match and retrieve a piece of information from that row. For example, if we have a list of production goals of how many days it should take to produce each garment type, like shirts and sweaters and pants, and the cost that we anticipate incurring and the price we anticipate fetching for each garment produced, we could use the VLOOKUP function to look up that data, target days, cost, or price, from elsewhere, like on the production schedule, back over here on our production sheet. That way we could compare target 
values with the actual production days that it took for each run. Note that the shirt target days was three, back over here on targets, sweater was four, pant was six. And so here in column G, we're gonna write a formula that will look up the target days value from that targets worksheet for the item, the garment type, specified here in column A, which is shirt. So we should end up with a three here, as we know it's a three day uh, target days for that, for that garment type. Now this first time I write the VLOOKUP function, I'll go ahead and use the insert function dialog box as it offers us some assistance. Clicking the insert function button, now I see the VLOOKUP function right here in the recently used category, but if it weren't, we would just jump into the lookup and reference category here and scroll through the alphabetized list to find VLOOKUP. The VLOOKUP function has four arguments. The first three are required, the last one optional, although I'm gonna teach you not to consider it optional at all. The first argument, lookup value, if we can use a needle and haystack analogy, the lookup value is what needle are we gonna go look for? Well, we're gonna go look for whatever is in column A of the row on which we're writing this formula. Okay, so the lookup value, we're gonna, go, we're gonna send it off saying, hey, go look for shirts. Go look for the entry called shirt. And where's the haystack? Well, that's here where we specify the table array. And the haystack, of course, is over on the targets sheet and it's the list of production targets. Note that I'm selecting the column that includes the key value that we're searching for and all the columns that I'd like to perhaps bring back information from, from any one of them. I'm, I know I'm gonna copy this formula later, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit the F4 key, the function key F4, to make that reference absolute. Uh, you Mac users would use command T, command T as in Tim, uh, to convert the referencing style to absolute. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then the third argument, column index num, is where you specify once you've found the right row, once you've gone and found the row that has the, your needle in this haystack, which column of information in this list has what you want, okay? And you don't specify it by letter, by A, B, C, or D. Rather, you specify it by the index number where the first column of the list, or table array, as Excel calls it, is column index number one, the second column is column index number two, the third is three, the fourth is four, and so on. Since we're trying to fetch the target days for the given garment type or item, target days is in the second column of this list, so we simply type a two into the column index number argument. Lastly, range lookup is a logical value, as they call it. In other words, we have to supply either the word true or the word false here. Now false, as we read in the description, means that we needed to find an exact match. True means, yeah, just get close. Close is close enough. In this case though, if it doesn't find something that exactly matches my item name, I don't want it to bring back some other garments target days number. So let's look for an exact match. If it doesn't find one, it will simply return a not applicable error. And we'll say okay. We get three, just like we were hoping. And as I double click the fill handle here on that formula cell, it will auto fill down through the rest of the thousand rows of data and give us our target days for each garment type. Now let's talk a little bit about that absolute referencing business. Why did we put dollar signs in the dollar A, dollar five through dollar D, dollar seven part of the formula? but not in this first A5 reference, simply because it allowed us to get the desired results when we copied the formula into the cells below. The formula in cell G5 refers to, a cell, refers to cell A5 using relative referencing, as it's called, because we did not put dollar signs in that reference. It thinks of it as the cell located six cells to my left. When we copy that logic into another cell, the relative reference points to a different cell. Because it started from a different cell. Thus, relative referencing makes it possible to duplicate formulas 
and have them reference the desired cell from their new location. Absolute referencing, on the other hand, where we add dollar signs when referencing a cell or range of cells, tells Excel not to use this relative position logic, like the six cells to my left, but rather to point to the specific cell or range of cells in every copy, like we did with our target list. When you create a cell reference in a formula, it uses relative referencing by default. To convert it to an absolute reference, you put dollar signs in front of the column letter and or row number as in $A, $5. The keyboard shortcuts for changing the referencing style of the selected cell reference are, as I've mentioned, the F4 key on Windows and the Command T keystroke on the Mac. Next, let's look up the cost and price values for each item produced, because remember we've got over here in targets, we have not only the number of days each production run should take, but the cost and price of each item type. First, I'll have to get rid of these two row, or these two columns of static data. I'm gonna select all the way to the bottom of the list using a wonderful little keyboard sh shortcut called Control Shift Down Arrow. Control Shift Down Arrow simply highlights in that direction, downward in this case, you can use any of the four arrow keys, until it runs out of data. And then I'll delete the contents of those cells. All right, in cell J5, we want to look up the cost of the item whose item name is specified over here in cell A5. This time I'll write the formula by hand so you can see it done that way as well. Equals VL, and that's enough for it to narrow down the list of choices to just the VLOOKUP function. You can either double click it with your mouse or just press the tab key found on the left hand side of your keyboard. It prompts us for the arguments in the form of this little pop-up tooltip message, making the current argument bold. The lookup value, that's the needle that we're searching for. Well, we're looking for shirt in this case, or in others, we're looking for whatever's in cell A5. Then we type a comma, and I like to put a space after my commas, it makes the formulas nicer to look at, but you don't have to. The next argument name became, becomes bold, table array, we'll go over to the targets sheet and select that same range that we did before. It hasn't moved. And likewise, we'll make it an absolute reference by using the F4 key to add the dollar signs. Comma, space. And now we need to specify the column index num. It's asking for column index num. Again, where we specify, once you've found the right row, go over, march over X number of columns to bring back such and such a piece of data. One, two, three, cost, which is what we want, is in the third column. So I'll put a three as the column index number value. And then lastly, after typing a comma, range lookup, we're gonna use false again because I don't want it to just come close. I need it to find an exact match of the item name or it's no deal. Hitting the enter key and it goes and fetches the cost of shirts, bingo. Now, because we also wanna look up price, let's try auto filling this formula across to the right. It's not gonna turn out very well. Uh-oh, we get NA. All right, let's see if we can figure out why. Well, because the original formula used a reference to A5 that was written relatively, which really means look at the cell or in, you know, use the cell that is nine cells to my left as the, as the lookup value. When we autofilled or copied that formula to a cell to its right, now nine cells to its left lands right here. That formula is pointing to cell B5, not A5 like we would have preferred. And so it's looking for extra large over here in our target sheet. No wonder we got a not applicable. Well, we're gonna solve that by fixing the original, not by changing the copies manually. Let's make the original formula smarter in regards to how it gets copied. To do this, we're gonna use a mixed reference. A mixed reference is one that's half relative and half absolute. We want the formula here in J5 to allow us to copy it horizontally and vertically without changing the column letter of the A5 reference, right? We want the A to stay the same so that when we copy it across, the copy still points to A5, which is where our 
item name is. But while it still changes the row numbers, so that when we copy the formula down, the next copy points to A6, the third copy points to A7, and so on. To accomplish this, we simply put a dollar sign, I'm going to type it manually, in front of the column letter to make the column aspect of that reference absolute, leaving the row number relative by not having a dollar sign in front of it. That's a mixed reference and it's incredibly useful when you need to copy formulas both horizontally and vertically. So let's see if it works. As we copy horizontally now, the copy points to A5 just like we were hoping. Sadly, it's retrieving the price value, or the cost value, excuse me, rather than the price, but that's just a matter of this number here. It's retrieving the value that's in the third column, and we want it to retrieve, in this case, the value that's in the fourth column. So I'll change that three to a four, hit enter, there we go. Then we can copy these formulas down through the bottom of the list. Success. Now the VLOOKUP function has a twin, HLOOKUP. The HLOOKUP function works the same as VLOOKUP, only rotated 90 degrees. It searches across the first row of a table or list until it finds the lookup value or closest match, and then marches down the specified number of rows and returns the contents of the cell there. Here in this budget sheet, notice the month name headings here in row four. And then income, and totals, expenses, and total expenses, and finally profit and loss, all budgeted for those six months. Let's say that here on the summary sheet, we'd like to be able to enter a month name and have a lookup function that retrieves the total income for that month, the total expenses, and the profit and loss value. We'll use HLOOKUP. Again, as before, I'll use the insert function dialog box the first time so that you can see how it's written that way. And HLOOKUP is there. And it looks very, very similar. Needle, haystack, index number, and range lookup. So in this case, our needle is sitting in cell A4. And I know I'm gonna copy this formula down to the next two cells, so I'm gonna go ahead now and make the referencing style of that A4 reference absolute by hitting the F4 key on my keyboard. The table array is the haystack we wanna go looking through, and that's the budget sheet, or it's on the budget sheet. And it's this range of cells here. Notice that I'm including the month row, that's critical because it's the first row of data that the HLOOKUP function is gonna look through. And I'm also including any of the rows that have meaningful data to us. Likewise, hitting the F4 key on the keyboard, types in the dollar signs there. Now the total income is what we're trying to retrieve and that's in row one, two, three, four, five. It's in the fifth row of our table array, of our list. So row index num needs to be five to tell it to bring back the, or fetch the total income value. And then range lookup, once again, needs to be false because we're needing it to find an exact match. And I'll click okay. And it goes and fetches the total in income for January. Copying that formula down, then we'd only need to change the, the row index num. Instead of retrieving the value that's in the fifth row, total expenses, I know this uh, because I rehearsed this in advance and know that the total expenses is in row 12, so I'll change the five to a 12 there, and we get the total expense value for the month of January. Likewise, I know that the profit and loss row in that budget table is, oops, in the 13th row, and there we go. Let's double check, make sure it's all right. So 350, 99, and 251. Fantastic. And if we change the month name, let's say we're interested in March now, the numbers all change as it goes and retrieves the values from the March column using HLOOKUP. All right, so that's how HLOOKUP and VLOOKUP work. But thus far, all of our lookups have referred to lists and not tables. But the, the table feature in Excel is way too useful to overlook. It provides benefits when working with data, including efficient selecting and formatting, and an elegant language for referencing parts of tables and formulas. 
Here on this commissions sheet, we see two lists, these gray ones here, that I've actually taken time in advance to convert into tables. You can tell if a list is a table or not by clicking in one of its cells and then noticing if the table design tab appears on the ribbon. If you're in a list that does not show the table design tab, it's not a table. It's just a normal list. Tables have some really great benefits. <clears throat> Notice also that I've named each of these tables, giving them meaningful names, the employees table, and likewise over here, the bonus rates table. So in this commission sheet, we're gonna write a formula in cell B4 that retrieves the last name of the employee whose ID number has been specified here. It'll be a simple V lookup, so equal VL, hit the tab key, the lookup value, that's the needle that we're searching for, is here, whatever's in cell, the cell to its left, and then comma, and now we come to the table array or list. Now, you could just start typing the name of the table if you have it memorized, but you could also click into the, or point into the upper left-hand corner of the table, and when you get this special pointer shape, a down diagonal or down right facing black arrow, click once, and that creates what's called a structured reference to the entire table. Uh, you see, there's a, a whole language of structured referencing of different parts of a table that just make tables so delightful to work with and make the formulas that you uh, involve those references in easier to read. I'll type a comma, column index num, well, we're trying to bring back the last name, so one, two, three, last name's in the third column, so we'll type a three and another comma, and then the word false, because we want to find an exact match, not just come close. Hitting the enter key, and it goes and finds that Cummings is the last name of employee number 16. Indeed it is. We'll autofill that down through the end of the list, and there we go. Note that when you use a table name or a range name of any sort, it takes care of the whole absolute reference business for you. You don't have to put dollar signs in that reference to the the lookup table because the name employees will always and only ever refer to that range of cells there no matter where you refer to it from. Any formula that uses that table name now knows where that table lives. So you get the absolute referencing uh, kind of as a bonus. If you're unsure how to convert a, a normal list into a table and therefore unlock all the powerful table tools, Here's how. I'll turn our production data list that we looked at earlier into a table. You simply select any one cell in the list and then on the home tab of the ribbon, click format as table. And literally just choose your favorite design. It asks you to confirm the size of your list or table and it almost always guesses exactly right and to confirm that your list has a header row. We talked about the importance of that earlier. We'll say okay, and now it's a table. Notice the table design tab appears anytime we're in it. One of the first things that you're gonna to wanna to do after creating a table is give that table a meaningful name. So come over here on the left side of the table design tab and give it a good name. I'll call this prod data. Keep in mind, no spaces are allowed in table names, okay? No spaces allowed in those table names. And I'll hit the enter key. Now you might be remembering that earlier in this webinar, we created a pivot table that was based on this body of data while it was still just a list. Now that the data is a table with a good meaningful name, we should go back over to the pivot table and edit it to refer to the table name as its data source. So we'll switch back into our pivot table Click anywhere in the pivot table and go to the analyze tab. And we'll use change data source to say, hey, you know what? I want you to be based on the table called prod data now. If I memorize the name, I could just type it. Or we can use that wonderful little trick that we learned earlier of pointing to the upper left corner of the table with that down diagonal pointing arrow and click once. And it types the name of that table for you. Click OK. The pivot pivot table doesn't change substantively because it's still referring to the same rows and columns and values, but it's smarter now uh, 
tables are easier to add new rows to. And so when the table grows over there in the source list, the pivot table will know that the, it has new rows and will, will refresh or update to include those new, new rows as soon as you refresh or close and open the workbook again. And that's how you create and reference a table. Now, up until now, all of our lookups have searched for exact matches. Next, we'll use a range lookup to search a series of numbers for the one that's closest to our lookup value. Back on the commission sheet, the five salespersons here each generated some amount of sales and are thus entitled to a commission percent as defined over here in the bonus rates table. It's highly unlikely, however, that we'd find exact matches like we have before, so we'll need to use a range lookup. Here in cell D4, I'll write a VLOOKUP function, VLOOKUP tab, that says, hey, go and find this employee's sales amount for this term and find it within the table array of the bonus rates table, looking through the first column. Again, that's what VLOOKUPs do. They look down the first column of the table array for a matching value or the or closest match. Okay, then I'll type a comma, column index num, we're trying to bring back the bonus rate, the percentage rate that that employee would have earned. So I'll type a two because rate is in the second column. And now we come to range lookup where I'll need to use true. Now, admittedly, we could just leave it blank. True is the default behavior, but I like to specify as it makes it more clear, more explicit. And we'll hit the enter key. And it says that uh, employee Cummings who sold $150,000 worth earned a 2% bonus and that's exactly right. Let's copy that down and see likewise that uh, employee Thompson who sold 440 earned a 5% bonus. So what it does is it looks down that first column. No, 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 it's looking for 440. No, not quite. When it gets to the 500,000 it realizes, oops, I've gone past it, it's too big and it drops back to the previous row and then retrieves, because we told it to, the value from the second column, 5%. Now, for range lookups to work, the rows in your lookup table must be sorted by that first column uh, from low to high in this case. So that's how a range lookup works. All right, we're nearing the end. VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP are popular functions, but they have some serious limitations. There's a new function, the XLOOKUP function, which overcomes these limitations. Now, note that this new function, XLOOKUP, was introduced in February 2020. And if you don't subscribe to Office 365 and install your updates regularly, you may not have received the software update that includes this new function, XLOOKUP. Here on the customer sheet, we have our customer list and a little search mechanism up top here. We'd like to, when a customer calls, be able to type their full name in here and have lookups that go and retrieve that customer's ID number and city and state, okay? So in ID, I'll type an equal sign and X, L, and hit the tab key. The lookup value, just like before, is the needle that we're searching for. In this case, it's whatever customer name we've typed in cell D4 and I'll set that to use absolute referencing by hitting the F4 key. Then a comma. Then it asks for the lookup array. That is, where's the haystack? Well, the haystack is the column of full names. So I'll select that first cell and then use that wonderful keyboard shortcut that I taught you earlier, control shift down arrow to select that whole list of customer full names. And I'll make it an absolute reference with F4 because I know I'm gonna copy this formula downward in a moment. Typing a comma now moves us to our third argument, the return array. Okay, so here's what XLOOKUP is gonna do. It's gonna look, at, look up this value in this red range here, and when it finds the row that it's on, it's going to return the value that's in the same row as whatever array you specify as your return array. So since we're trying to bring back IDs, I'm going to select that whole ID column and make it an absolute reference. So the return array, in other words, which column or which uh, range of data, the word array simply means range or list, which list of uh, field value, cell values has what you want me to go and bring back for you. And we wanna bring back IDs. 
I'll type a comma, and then I love this, the XLOOKUP function adds an if not found argument. It's optional, that's why it's surrounded in uh, square brackets, but we can do something like this. We could say, you know what, just give me the phrase customer not found if, the, if we entered a customer whose name is not in the customer list. And then I'll close off with the right parentheses. The last two arguments are optional and we'll, this will work fine without them. And I hit enter and Vern Kritzer is indeed customer number 104. Let's see if we can bring back the city and state as well. I'll just copy that formula down. And then simply changing the return array from, instead of referring to the range A10 through A36 where the IDs live, let's return F10 through F36. That is, we'll change the return array to the city column and hit enter and it brings back Manchester. Likewise, instead of bringing back IDs, we'll bring back the values from column G from in the, in the cell range G10 through G36 and hit enter and it brings back New Hampshire. And likewise, as you would expect, if I were to type a different customer name here into our search field, the results all change. All right, so that's what XLOOKUP does. Makes a good improvement over VLOOKUP and XLOOKUP. Now we've covered a lot of ground during this lunch hour. And I really hope it's benefited you and will make your job easier. <clears throat> we teach these topics and many, many others in our live public training classes. So please go to our website at acceleratecomputertraining.com to see the classes we offer and what you can learn. You can register right on the site and you may attend either remotely or in person. We're located in downtown Long Beach and we hope to see you all in an upcoming training session soon. Also, we recorded this webinar and we'll send you the link as soon as it's up on our YouTube channel. In the description of the video on YouTube, I'll include a link to the two exercise files I used so that you can download them to use in your own study and practice. All right, I know that we're right at time or maybe a minute or two over, so, um, have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for attending. I'll stay on for a, another minute or two and look at the chat to see if there are any questions. So you're welcome to hang around for a little bit longer. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day and weekend and practice those pivot tables and lookups.